A town assembly near the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has called for more decontamination work before evacuees are allowed to return. Ten members from the Naraha Town Assembly, including the chairman, Motoi Aoki, visited the Environment Ministry. The delegation handed a written demand to Senior Vice Minister Shinji Inoue. Most parts of Naraha Town were designated as an evacuation zone after the nuclear accident in March 2011. The area is currently being prepared for early resettlement. The demand urges the central government to reduce annual radiation exposure to below one millisievert before residents return home. It says the government should be responsible for decontaminating and cleaning inside houses and buildings. It also calls for the thorough decontamination of the bottom of the town's Kido Dam. Inoue reportedly told the delegation that the ministry will respond to the requests in a sincere manner with other relevant government offices. Naraha town officials plan to decide the timing for the return of residents as early as later this month. A worker at Fukushima Daiichi says he was put in a dangerous situation and he wants compensation. He says he was exposed to high levels of radiation after the accident at the nuclear plant three years ago. And he says the operator didn't warn him of the dangers. The man is asking for more than $100,000 in damages. He worked for a subcontractor of Tokyo Electric Power Company. His bosses sent him to the plant about two weeks after the accident. He says his job was to connect power cables in the turbine building of the number three reactor. He says there were puddles of contaminated water in the basement, and he carried a dosimeter to measure the radiation in the air. He says the readings showed he'd received almost half the maximum annual government limit after just 90 minutes of work. The man says he wasn't told about the high levels of radiation. He's filed a lawsuit to push for better working conditions. More than 30,000 people have been employed at the plant since the accident. TEPCO officials say they'll handle the matter sincerely once they learn the details of the Seismologists are anticipating a mega quake off western Japan. They say such a tremor may send massive tsunami waves toward the Philippines and other Asian countries. University of Tokyo assistant professor Tomoya Harada conducted research as part of a national project. He simulated tsunami waves that could hit countries around Japan. It would be generated by a magnitude 9 level quake along the Nankai Trough deep beneath waters south of Japan. The simulation shows that tsunami waves would reach the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries in three to four hours after the quake. A more than four-meter-high tsunami may hit wide areas of the region. In Mindanao Island of the Philippines, a tsunami could rise as high as eight meters. The study shows tsunami will also reach the Chinese coast. One to two-meter-high tsunami would reach Shanghai and surrounding areas nine hours after the quake. Japan should think about joint coping measures together with East Asian and Pacific countries. University of Tokyo professor Takashi Furumura stressed the need for tsunami warning systems and evacuation drills in each country. He's also calling for international rescue and relief plans. Floodgates protect people from tsunamis and floods. Up until now, humans close the gates, either by hand or remote control. But following the March 2011 disaster, people have questioned the effectiveness of these gates. Now, engineers in Japan have come up with a new kind that might work better in a disaster. NHK World's Akane Nakajima has the report. Yeah, Researchers have developed a new kind of floodgate. It is activated by flowing water. No manual power is needed. Some conventional seawalls have floodgates that blocks water, but lets people and vehicles through. In emergencies, most gates have to be closed manually or by electricity. During the disaster of March 2011, Power failed everywhere. Volunteer firefighters tried closing the gates, 
but in the effort, more than 60 died. This drew attention to a problem within the system. This is a demonstration facility of a new floodgate. This demonstration model uses the force of the wave to shut it without using any electricity or manpower. The main component to this floodgate system is the door. The outside is stainless steel. The gate normally lies flat. It can withstand the weight of people or vehicles. The body of the gate has a special material that is strong but light enough to float. If the door is buoyant, it floats, but it cannot stop the water. With this new floodgate, two hinges fasten the door to the ground. When the water makes contact, it pushes the door up. The gate has to be light enough to float on water, but strong enough so as not to collapse. The gate costs 10 to 20 percent less to build than a conventional one. That's because its construction is simple and it doesn't need a motor. As well, not much maintenance is needed. Hajime Mase specializes in disaster prevention research at Kyoto University. He is one of the people who developed the new floodgate. He says it could be used for a variety of purposes. We are now facing a global warming, and the global warming makes uh, storm surges and waves uh, bigger and bigger. That means uh, overflow from the sea walls and uh, overtopping over a uh, sea wall is make severe. At that place, a uh, floodgate is very useful to set at the entrance of the underground shopping mall or something. Using this new method, firefighters no longer have to risk their lives to close the floodgates. They can focus on helping people, as well as themselves. This advancement may save many lives. Akane Nakajima, NHK World, Sakai. Children in northeastern Japan have found it hard to recover from the devastating earthquake and tsunami three years ago. But a veteran photographer has been helping them to express their feelings through pictures. Life after the disaster, as seen through the eyes of children who lived through it. This exhibition is a record of the young photographer's inner lives over the past three years. Along with the title, each image has a caption expressing the child's thoughts when it was taken. It was photojournalist Hirohiko Shoji who organized the exhibition. He came up with the idea of giving children single-use cameras. He told them to take photos of anything they liked and also to express their thoughts in words. At first, many of them looked at their feet and rarely raised their heads. But then they began to speak their mind through photography. Eventually, they began to look up both in real life and in their photography. And I realized that their spirits had turned upward. One child Shoji has been working with is Masaki Sasaki. His mother, Aya, perished in the tsunami. When Shoji first met him, Masaki was lost in his grief. But encouraged to start taking photos, he started to come to terms with his loss. Three months after the disaster, he took this photo of his ruined city. He gave it the title, Our Helplessness. In the caption, he wrote, I vow to repair this someday. He was set on rebuilding his hometown. A year later, he took a photo of the slippers that his mother used to wear. He called it Me and Mother. Masaki was starting to use his photography to deal with her absence. After two and a half years, he finally built up the courage to photograph his mother's grave. The title he gave it, 
going to see my mother. He took a lot of photos as he approached his mother's gravestone, and finally he took this image using the built-in flash on his camera. My mother was bright and cheerful, so I wanted my photo to be full of light. Little by little, Shoji is helping children like Masaki to move forward with their lives. In March, he gets the result of his high school entrance exam. My number's up there. <laughs> He's won a place at the local technical high school just as he wanted. There's an important photo he needs to take. his successful number in the high school entrance exam. He gives it the title, The First Step Toward My Dream. Alongside the photo, he writes about his determination to become an architect. I want to help with the reconstruction effort. I want to turn our city into a place where everybody can live without worries and be filled with smiles. This spring, Masaki has entered high school and is taking his first step to fulfilling his dreams and keeping his vow. The shores are fascinated by what could be the latest debris coming from the 2011 Japanese tsunami. It's a boat completely covered in sea life. Como Forest Keith Eldridge tells us the family that found it calls it a bittersweet discovery. It's hard to see the boat through all the gooseneck barnacles that attach to it during what may have been a 5,000-mile journey from Japan. State Park's rangers hauled it from the beach to their storage yard so ecology experts can get a good look at it. When this boat first washed up on shore, it was covered with all this sea life. It's all dying now, but the big question is, was it some sort of dangerous invasive species? The good news is any oil or hazardous materials um, have been rolled out, so there's um, no immediate threat to the environment, human health or safety. And no signs of radiation. Yes, it was right, right over here. The Mead family of Ocean Shores found it out in front of their place yesterday after and we pulled up on it, took a good look at it, took some pictures of it, found it very interesting. It's uh, definitely from the tsunami. If that proves to be the case, it'll be the latest of items that have washed ashore, including a huge dock and several other vessels and items that all are believed the result of the devastating earthquake and tsunami that hit Japan in 2011, washing away lives and washing away their belongings that have shown up on Washington shores. We see shoes. One time we saw a doll. I just couldn't even even pick it up. I think about the, the children that had to go through that horrible experience and the families that were torn apart. Well, we haven't seen the huge amounts of debris that were once predicted. Ecology tells us there is no Texas-sized debris field heading this way, but items could keep showing up for a generation. Items such as what the Meads found just today. It's a Rollington float. One that is believed to have belonged to a Japanese fisherman before disaster hit. In Ocean Shores, Keith Eldridge, Como 4 News. If you're on the beach and you find an item that could be from the tsunami, you're asked to call the State Department of Ecology. Well, blue sea, palm trees, and white sand. This might look like a real paradise, but it's not all that pristine. This place is called the Marshall Islands, and it's one of the most contaminated in the world. Several decades ago, the U.S. conducted more than 60 nuclear tests there. Well, it's tired of all the nuclear garbage, so the islanders filed a lawsuit against the United States and other nuclear superpowers, including Russia. Well, the Pacific state says that these countries are not reducing their nuclear stockpiles, but modernizing them instead, and that's illegal. Joining me in the now is Beatrice Finn. She's from the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Thanks for being with us. Uh, it's been several decades since the last nuclear tests were carried out on the Marshall Islands. Why are they acting now? Well, uh, Marshall Islands isn't actually suing the nine nuclear armed states because of the tests. Uh, they're suing them because of the failure to uh, to negotiate nuclear disarmament, which is a commitment under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So Marshall Islands is arguing that these states are not taking their legal responsibility um, into consideration right now, and, and therefore they're suing them. Obviously the nuclear tests and the experience of the Marshall Island people uh, is, is cause for, for um, 
uh, pursuing this lawsuit from the beginning, and they have a very strong moral obligation to nuclear disarmament. I understand that they're not actually seeking compensation, they're seeking action, but what kind of action could we really see? Well, the five nuclear armed states under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, China, France, Russia, United States and the United Kingdom, have signed this treaty that commits them to negotiate nuclear disarmament. So what Marshall Islands is really trying to do here is to get them to live up to those commitments and to start negotiations to eliminate nuclear weapons. Do you think that they'll uh, be taken seriously them doing that though? So far. They continue to... Uh, we'll see. Uh, not all of these states are um, under um, obligatory um, commitment to take ICG um, rulings on, uh, in, under consideration, so we'll see. But the United Kingdom, for example, has to answer to this, uh, this lawsuit and provide their counter-arguments within 60 days. Uh, but isn't it more about geopo geopolitics for these big countries? I mean, the, the rule of the game is the more nukes you have, the stronger and more influential you are. Uh, at least that's how it's seen on the global stage. And there's no way that nuclear superpowers are going to uh, lessen their arms because of these islands. Well, they have already signed a treaty that, that uh, commits them to nuclear disarmament. So they, they are obliged to do that under international law. And the International Court of Justice has ruled in 1996 that they need to uphold this commitment. Uh, now it's just a question of when. Nuclear weapons are pretty useless for actually fighting those kind of uh, geopolitical battles that states uh, uh, face today. They are not very clumsy, big, and cause catastrophic humanitarian harm anywhere they will be used. Um, they're not really modern war tools of warfare anymore. What do you make of the fact that this is, is declared one of the most contaminated places on earth and instead of declaring uh, some kind of cleanup or help, they're, I mean, a lot of people would say aiming for something that's not really realistic. Well, I think it's about um, raising awareness as well about this issue. Um, Marshall Islands have seeked compensation before, uh, both in national courts in the United States and they've been talking in the Human Rights Council with the Special Rapporteur on, on environmental issues. It's not, it's not a new issue there and it's been raised several times before um, and they have been um, fighting for this for a very long time. But I think this is really about looking to the future, uh, not just looking at the past, but also look at nuclear weapons and the fact that we continue to allow some states to have these weapons when we've banned other weapons of mass destruction, like biological weapons and chemical weapons. All right, Beatrice Finn from the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Thanks so much for being in the now. Russia's defense troops have successfully launched three intercontinental ballistic missiles as part of planned military drills. The defense ministry said the maneuvers had nothing to do with Ukraine, but are aimed at practicing methods for countering nuclear strikes. Well, two of the rockets were launched from strategic submarines in the country's Pacific fleet, while the third was fired from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome in northern Russia. The Russian president has attended a summit aimed at finding ways to override massive nuclear missile attacks. ...has designed a new spacesuit for future Mars missions. The U.S. space agency aims to send a manned expedition to the Red Planet by 2030s. The next generation outfit features patches on the chest that emit blue light. The idea is to help astronauts see each other in the dark. It's also designed to be more durable to protect astronauts during long periods of activity. The new spacesuit allows more flexibility. NASA plans to start performance tests for the Z2 in November. They'll take place in a Mars-like environment at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. You're watching RT International Live from Moscow. Welcome back. Roaming the Red Planet could soon become an everyday reality for a bunch of ordinary Earthlings. An international project is aiming to establish the first human settlement on Mars. And for any pioneers up to that venture, it will be a one-way trip. And here's a quick look at how the first Martian colony will look. Will look. The ambitious Mars One project wants to create self-contained units set up close to each other to provide a cozy and viable living environment for settlers. And the idea is giving real hope to those those willing to become a real Martian local. The project was launched in 2011 and is set to send first Mars mission in 2024. Some 200,000 candidates from across the globe have applied to take part in the project and so far just over 700 are still in the running and only six teams of 
four will be picked and the lucky bunch will leave Earth after a rover and a cargo ship have prepared the terrain ahead of uh, their arrival. But the colonizers won't be able to return back home. And uh, Matt Trezor caught up with two project hopefuls, one from Moscow and one from Quebec. This has got to be hitting you at this point, or has it hit you yet, that this is a one-way ticket. This is something that the way the program is currently designed, if you get chosen, you're not coming back. How has that affected your thought process on this, and why are you both continuing to go forward with this with that in mind? The thought has been there since the very, very beginning that this is a one-way trip. If it became possible to come home after several years, um, I'm not even 100% sure that I would jump on that ship simply because it's not part of the mission. It's not in the plans of the mission. It was like one way trip, uh, don't really scare me. Because uh, each new day is a one, day, uh, one way trip to the future. Has either of you gotten reached out to uh, your national space agencies um, and tried to speak with someone who's actually kind of been there, done that, about the actual rigors of being in orbit? I had a, an interview with uh, uh, astronaut uh, Suraev Maxim. He had never heard about Mosmo project, so I've talked about it, and he just like, uh, uh, hey, girl, just better uh, find a husband, uh, just make children and be happy. Why do you need this Mars? <laughs> and what did you think about that? <laughs> Our Russian guys, uh, when they're asked about uh, finding a girlfriend instead of going Mars, they say, can you ever pretend to have a girlfriend that you can uh, be better than Mars? <laughs> so I can say <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> You mentioned, Norm, that you have a, uh, a bucket list, so to speak, if you are finally selected as one of the finalists. You'll have 10 years, basically, to do everything that you want to do on Earth for the last time. What are some of the things that are tops on this list for you? Well, right now, the, I, I'm, there's this one, there's this, um, an elephant nature park in Thailand, uh, where you go and you, and you, you live with the elephants. And, and it's a real community with the elephants. And you spend a week there, uh, and I think this is definitely something. I've always had a, a, a big heart for elephants, uh, being the social and intelligent creatures. Upon leaving, what do you think you would miss the most? I think uh, I would miss, uh, uh, surely, uh, for the first place, my friends and my family. But uh, apart from this, uh, I think I would miss uh, eating uh, meat. <laughs> we will have to become all vegetarians. How about you, Norm? What would you miss? Oh, without a doubt, the first thing I miss would be my, my family, uh, particularly my mother and my children. I have two children, ages 6 and 10 now. Hmm. They'll be a little, they'll be older, obviously, when we go. They'll still, they'll be young men, but, um, but no, absolutely, those, those will be the, the things I miss the most. And uh, how have they been taking this, and how have your parents and your other relatives been taking this uh, decision that you say you want to make? Everybody's been really supportive. Uh, I think maybe part of that is the, the fact that it's, they might not quite believe it yet. Do you think that uh, mankind's future is in space? I mean, do you see yourselves as trailblazers here? Ab absolutely. Every science fiction movie that we've seen that takes place in space with other planets had to start somewhere. And it looks like it's going to be us. Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. We need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.